Hello, everybody. Happy Saturday and welcome to my webinar once again. For those who know me, I am Patricia Hebole, which you already knew. Um, I'm so happy to be with you today because we've got an exciting guest, um, you know, with the theme that we are with. And um, you know I'm all about the elite mindset. It's about pushing the bar. It's not just about winning, but it's a pushing the bar, being the best that you can be. And then, you know, for the parent side, I share a little bit of my own experience being that I I'm a parent as well. And then my, my father was my coach. And uh, for those who don't know me or new to me, welcome. I am Patricia Hibule. I was on the tour uh, for the tennis tour for many years uh, with a career high singles ranking of 26. And uh, my era of players included, but not limited to, uh, Steffi Graf, uh, Maracha Sanchez, Monica Salas, Martina Hingis. And for those of you who are really young, you may not know them, but they were the greatest. And um, I am uh, honored to play in three Olympics, uh, Los Angeles, Barcelona, and Atlanta. Um, I have to say my favorite one was in Los Angeles just because I was attending um, UCLA at the time, and that was really cool. And after I retired from the tour, I became a coach, worked with young players, national players, and transition players to the tour. And um, then I became a mom and I'm also a mom coach, uh, co-coaching our two children who are attending um, um, the uh, OSU, Ohio State University and are playing on the men's and women's team. And um, so in recent years, I decided to step away from on-court coaching into a, the arena of um, helping players, parents, and coaches to form a dream team, a solid team that um, they can provide you, the player, with the best opportunities um, and you know, to shine with your potential. And before the... Um, before the pandemic, um, you know, I was traveling a lot, uh, speaking at conferences and at clubs, just doing my best to share my experiences and bringing a, a team uh, behind every success athlete um, is a team. And I know my journey would not have been possible without my dad, who was a solid team, you know, with me. And then later on, I went through a couple of coaches and then um, to, and my career wouldn't have taken off with that without the help of my husband, um, Yves Boulay. So I'm trying to do the same for everyone, just bringing everyone together. Tennis journey is challenging and um, information is not always accurate. Um, so I'm doing, you know, I, this is everything I share with you is, it has been true and tried or tried and true. And it's, um, if you want to read more of the blog post, um, they, you can find them at patriciahe.com and that's patriciahy.com and um before this before we all got shut down and now with our life turning upside down um i was doing the blogging and traveling but then a few weeks ago about four weeks ago i decided i'm gonna host a webinar so with that in mind i had objectives for each uh, webinar and i grouped them the first group um, which if you were able to log on um, um, on those webinars, you know, we had uh, Gabby Dabrowski, world number seven doubles ranked player, um, had a chat with us on her tennis journey. And then we had Allison Risk, who's ranked number 19 in the singles on the WTA tour, sharing her, her tennis journey uh, with her dad. And then last week, um, you know, we had... Um, uh, Layla Annie Fernandez, we just call her Layla uh, Fernandez. You know she is has just come through the junior, was number one um, on the ITF junior, and just came through to the tour very very quickly, and um, and the um, her journey was also inspired um, by her dad, whom. By the way, that's whom I will be bringing on with us um, a little in a few minutes time. So that was my first group of guests um, revolved around the objective was to share the perspective from the elite mindset from athletes. And um, 
And then the second group that we are in now, it's really sharing the perspective from a tennis parent coach or high performance coach. Um, when I say high performance, you know, it's not just about going on the tour. It's just really about getting the best that you can from these coaches and from these players. With the pandemic, what it's doing is it's taking away a lot of scholarships with the fundings. You know, footballs are being cut, and, and that's a big part of the school. And um, fundings are going to be cut. And so, um, and traveling is going to be so expensive that a lot of the players who are just on the cusp may not just, may just decide they're not going to go on a tour route and then going to go to, uh, to college. And that, and that bottleneck is going to make it even harder to have a scholarship. So if you have players, they are younger, this is the time to start to learn from those who are having the elite mindset because that is, I'm telling you, that is the route that the college are going to be seeing the UTR matters right? and the, the level of play. So start them young. And if you are 16, 17, it's not that you're doomed, but you're going to have to take a different route. And that's why I'm doing what I do with, on the webinar is just to share pure elite mindset from athletes, from the, from the coach's standpoint. Um, my group three will be, um, a, a combination of the legends and from college players themselves. So everything is categorized with an intention of hopefully you will, after each session with me on Saturday, um, that you will walk away with something. So with um, without further ado, before I forget though, if you are just dying, absolutely dying to get a hold of me, so email me at um, Patricia HY. Sorry, Patricia at PatriciaHe.com. I even forgot my own email address. So that is Patricia at PatriciaHe.com. So um, last weekend, if you had uh, were able to join us, we talked about Layla Fernandez, who won the Junior French Open, was finalist at um, the Australian Open uh, in the juniors, and had already... Um, was in three pro tournaments and having won one of them. So we now want to know from the tennis parents coach standpoint that and that's a very tricky line to cross over um, because you've got that pressure you have to deal with, the relationship you've got to deal with. So the ins and outs. And this is um, with this one hour session, we're going to dig deep. I'm going to open up the Q&A. So please send them in questions. I already got a bunch of questions that was emailed me earlier. So I'm going to open the Q&A box, please. Just send me um, your your uh, questions, and I will do my best to have them answered. So here we go. Um, uh -huh. So we have a little bit of a hiccup, so bear with me. Hello. Hey. You're back. I, I am. I disconnected and called back. Oh, that look at just... you. Look at your smartness. All right. Thank <laughs> you. I was like, where did it go? <laughs> How are you? The journey continues. <laughs> the journey continues. So how are you doing today? Did you already have a training session? Actually, they're training right now as we speak. We were a little bit rained out this morning. Um, so we just kind of laid everything and we did our... Um, video analysis uh, work this morning as opposed to being on court. So. Very, very cool. Never a dull moment in the Fernandez family. <laughs> no, not, <laughs> not, especially if you ask them. Yes. So I am tuning in, as you know, from Toronto, and we have absolutely beautiful weather today. Fantastic. Where are you tuning in from? Finally, Boynton Beach, Florida, and um, we are having beautiful weather again today so that's good yeah it started off it started off raining but then uh, i got sunny again and you know that's one that's why we're here right to, to train absolutely so um has the pandemic stop you from training um really you know to be honest i mean um here in florida the, the rules were a little bit different um it was a little bit more um you know placed on each individual to be a little bit more responsible. 
for us, it really didn't affect us that much until they closed the, pub, the public courts. Once they closed the public courts, then we kind of had to get in contact with certain people that had private courts. And uh, we just followed the rules, right? I mean, you know, social distancing. So we just stayed together, you know, as a, as a group, as a team. And we didn't really see anybody else. And we kept going. Of course, I cut the program down by about half um, because there is no beginning date to the season when all of this was happening. You know, the dates keep, kept getting pushed off and, you know, you got to reanalyze your periodization. You got to reanalyze your, your, uh, your fitness program, how it entails, how it, you know, falls into place. And, um, you know, the number one objective in, in our team is always health, you know, both, uh, mentally, well, I'm going to say both, all three, mentally, emotionally, and of course, physically. Absolutely. Um, so, I am so interested um, in your tennis journey with Layla and for our audience who may not know is that you have a second daughter, Bianca, who is also playing. So you don't just have one, you have three daughters, but two of them are really on the making. Yeah, absolutely. I think, um, you know, it's a funny story. I mean, Bianca has always been the one you know, under, let's say under the age of 12, right? Under the age of 12, Bianca was the one who needed the less work, right? She was, you know, way ahead of her sister. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in our family, I, I've always said, you know, we start with the oldest and we make our way down. <laughs> so, you know, you, I, I, I wish I could have been separated into two pieces, you know, um, but it was a little bit difficult to do. We haven't figured out how to do it yet. So yeah, Bianca's doing really well now. Um, we had a little bit of setback with her. Um, you know, she has uh, a skin condition, eczema. Yeah. And um, eczema really hit her hard, you know, really hit her hard on her arms, um, hit her hard on her neck, her face. Yeah. And, and for some of, some of um, you know, some of you know that eczema is also ignites with anxiety and nerves and stress. Oh. Uh, that's tennis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. so unfortunately, you know, although we kept training, we minimized a lot of the, the tournament schedule. Okay. Um, we also altered a little bit the training schedule to try to figure out what is the best way to go through what she was going through, you know, and, um, you know, whenever we saw that her skin was, was, was fine and, and she was okay, because obviously, you have to understand that anything that is out of control, your control also attacks a little bit your psychology, right? Your, your psychology, your, your mindset, and it's in, in a way it's heavy. But yeah. um, so whenever we got a chance to travel, we did. And, you know, sometimes it would act up. Sometimes it wouldn't act up. It, it's pretty easy to see that when it didn't act up, she did well. You know, when it did act up, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult for her. Um, but you know, we see the, the light at the end of the tunnel right now, you know, I think she's growing out, she's growing out of it because it does stop eventually, mm. you know? Okay. So we're starting to ramp up again, you know, and she's causing, you know, Layla a whole bunch of trouble on the court, which is fantastic to see, <laughs> you know, sibling, sibling rivalry. Um, so yeah, she's doing good. You know, we've had to look at her development from a different lens and, um, you know, make some different decisions that are more altered to her specific case. But, um, you know, like I said, we see the light at the end of the tunnel. She's very hungry. She wants to get out there. She wants to play. And, you know, what more can you ask? Absolutely. How, what's the age difference? It's 18 months. Oh, just 18. like mine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we're very similar. Uh, absolutely. Um, so what I'm really intrigued by your, um, the tennis journey with you and your, your, your daughters is the fact that you don't play tennis, but, but you are, are an athlete, heart and right. soul. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the easiest way to explain it is, you know, you know, when I, I like to look at analogies all the time in life. I try to look at a little bit at, uh, at some parallels, right? So, you know, if you as a father, you know, you're a mechanic, you know, you're a lawyer, you're a doctor, you know, uh, you're a real estate agent, it doesn't matter your profession, 
you have some sort of grounding that you're able to help your, your son or daughter into becoming either a mechanic, an engineer, another profession. Because at the basis of you being a professional, there are certain things that are just not negotiable, right? Um, there's certain um, aspects of why you're a professional or what is defined as a professional that, you know, will never change, you know, throughout time will never change. You will never meet, you know, a professional um, that doesn't have some of those, if not all of those principles and value sets, right? Me being an ex-athlete, ex-soccer player, um, I was able to share with them, you know, some of my learnings and some of the difficulties in going into that lifestyle, which, you know, um, at, the, at the time, you know, in Canada, you know, and, and still now, you know, and you can quote me on it, but Canada is still yet to being a, a powerhouse in soccer, right? This is not who we are yet. That doesn't mean that we don't have the talent in the, in the youth in, you know, in the, in the players. And it doesn't mean that we don't have the talent in coaches, you know, but we are not there from a, um, an athletic sport minded culture to understand what it takes to get to the next level. So I understand what it takes to, to get to the next level. So we were able to have some more profound conversations around that, obviously based on their age, you know, we're not going to get into deep things when I know they don't understand. But um, we were able to discuss some, some, some things such as, you know, hard work, suffering, endurance, and perseverance, you know, and what it means in each one of those age categories. And I had an intimate relationship with hard work, suffering, and perseverance. So, you know, I was kind of the, the expert in that, having gone through it, and I was able to really you know, shine a light on those, on those themes while, you know, during the development. Um, yeah, I think I saw firsthand about the suffering part. <laughs> yeah. Um, but um, this is, you know, my, my work revolves around the elite mindset a lot because that's how, that's how I am. That's how I was brought up. Um, you know, I, I call them the five pillars. You know, because that's what I found out throughout my, you know, times on, on the, my duration of in com competing among the best, whether it's the men or the female, the five pillars, you know, are passion, right? Perseverance, you know, right. stuff, you know all those may be different words, but the values yeah. absolutely the same. It doesn't really matter the labels of it. Um, what um, is interesting is throughout my tennis journey, when I was coming on the tour, I, you know, I saw a few players whose parent dads, mainly were dads, were they coach. So was my own, right? My dad was my right. coach. Um, it's interesting to see the dynamics. Some uh, were very aggressive. And then, you know, it, it saddens me, truly, it saddens me to read books and to hear um, and to see because I witnessed it, right? And yeah. that just get the daylight out of me. And there is a, an art. It is an art to, to transition between a parent, from a parent to a coach and still minding that relationship because that is going to be there forever. The tennis comes and goes, right? So how do you juggle with that? Oh, that's uh, that's extremely difficult. You know, I will never, I will never look at somebody and say that, that that's easy to do. You know, that's impossible. I mean, even just the other day, I was just um, saying, you know, I was we were going through some exercises that were really difficult after a long day of training, and, and I said, you know, if you think that this doesn't hurt me, that I have to do this, you know, you're wrong because you're my kids, you're my girls. You know, my only objective when you were born was really to protect you, you know, not to put you through difficulty. So it goes against my, my initial parental, you know, instinct. Right. But, um, you know, the, the, the thing is, is that when we analyze what it is that we have to do, um, and we're not getting it from somewhere else now, you know, again, you know, my daughters are not the biggest athletes out there, right? They're not the strongest. And when you have a whole coaching system that is used to coaching stereotypical athletes that are 
taller, that are stronger. They don't specifically match what we have, you know. Now, I come from a different sport. I come from soccer. You know, you know, let's let's call it almost like a hockey coach at the highest level, you know, and, and it's a very passionate type of communication. You know, it's a very um, em- emotional roller coaster being in communication with your coaches. You know, they're not they're not there to please you and satisfy you. You know, they don't really care because they have other people that they can put in into your spot. Well, is, you know, you try to find a little bit of, you know, relaxation between because you don't have a sub, you don't have somebody to say, come in and, and take this person's place. So you try to build on that tranquility, that serenity. So of course, I've made some mistakes along the way. I've learned along the way also how, how to do the right thing in the right moment for the right age group. That doesn't mean that at some point, you know, I put my dad hat on when I shouldn't put my dad hat on, right? So, you know, it's very, very difficult. I've made mistakes. I've also corrected those mistakes. The one thing that I can honestly say um, that has separated, you know, myself with, I guess, other fathers maybe, and, you know, with my kids is that I've always told, I've always told Bianca and Lele, look, I'm never going to lie to you. I'm always going to give you the truth. And our relationship has to be based on truth. So if at any part of this, you know, adventure that we're on, you want to have somebody else as a coach, it's not an issue for me. I'm just feeling a void right now because there's not a coach that understands who you are, you know, physically, naturally with your abilities. I understand it because I myself am not a very tall person. I'm five foot eight. I'm five foot eight. I was five foot eight playing against six footers, you know, it's not an easy thing, you know, so you have a different learning, a different life that you have to teach them about being a competitor. And that honesty at first is harsh. If you ask Layla now, you know, or even Bianca, they don't want it any other way. And believe me, I've had many, many days where I wanted to quit. (laughs) I'm throwing in the towel and I'm saying, you know, find yourself somebody else, you know, and the very next day they're asking me, please, no, we don't want to go with anybody else. And this, these are the moments where they've actually had a lot of choices to have go, to go get some coaching. You know, my daughter went to Montreal and, and spent some time there almost six months. And then she decided that it wasn't for her. She wanted to be back under my tutelage, you know, and, and, you know, I, when I was talking to her on the phone, I said, you know what you're asking, right? You know what you're saying? Because when you come back, I'm going to double it, you know? So, and, you know, she was talking to me on the phone and she goes, you know, yes, you know, in Spanish, she goes, yes, Papi, this is exactly what I want. So somewhere along the line, her work ethic, her willingness to go beyond is bigger than she is, you know? And we match. So what may seem like chaos sometimes from the outside, you don't have the intimacy view of what it means. You know, the other day we went for a run and it was almost 9 p.m. I think we had texted and we went for a run late at night because it was part of our program. And, um, you know, I'm running with them. I'm suffering with them. So that creates something, you know. What, you know what it's um what caught my attention though is that you know interesting word you use was match because um all this happens makes it possible it's because the girls want it themselves yeah. that that is the biggest thing because you can't as my husband likes to say i don't know it's a french uh, saying you can't push a rope <laughs> i don't know but <laughs> you know Absolutely. but um you know, I remember seeing Layla at the center with, and, and I was there, you know. So, um, yeah, I can definitely see because she is brought up, you know, kids are, kids inherit the values from home, right? Yeah. And this is sometimes it frustrates me with um, some tennis parents, right? Yeah. Um, 
they they send the the kids to an academy program. They have a coach for a year or two, but they question. They question. You know, they, they'll come to me, and now I don't. You know, my job is to to unite. My job is to unite the te- the parent, the player, and the coach as one, as a team. Trust is a big thing for me. Is if this it's not ninety nine point nine percent, it has to be a hundred percent. And my advice to them has always been: Well, if you don't trust, then leave, go somewhere else. Um, when I went to hear Layla, especially, she knows that you know her upbringing with you. Uh, you're about expectations. You're about you know if you say you're gonna you're gonna want to go here, you better these are the roads, and I'm gonna take you there, and no shying back the truth and it's not easy it's not easy right she obviously trusts you tremendously with her career with her not just a journey with her career right no so absolutely, absolutely. You, i'm sorry no i said okay. yeah absolutely go ahead yeah so you know what would your advice be because you know obviously as parents stepping putting tennis aside as parents we want to give up our, our kids the best opportunities everything we can to to you know to, to live a better life than than we we had what would your advice to parents be and now we're not talking about pro level we're talking about the highest that they can be right what right. would your advice be for parents who have their kids and trying to jump to different programs or camps. Yeah, I think, you know, that's, I think you've presented it very well. And, and really my, my personal advice, you know, and I've been doing this for a long time. I was also coaching soccer. I've always had, you know, parents that, that have come up to me and say, you know, my, my, my son deserves to play more than what he's playing. My son deserves this. It's a normal, it's a normal feeling in this specific, in this specific, you know, type of arena, um, the number one foundation is trust, as you said, a hundred percent. You have to go to a coach or a program and trust in it. Okay, it's a two-way street. So first, you know, you have to have a coach that is willing to explain to you in the beginning, before it's before the program starts, what they're going to do and what their objective is. Right. This is a, This is an important part. Secondly, the parent has to accept it, understand it and say, yeah, I'm I'm in for this. Right. And then that begins the communication. So then you trust them. And now you have to trust them. You know, mom and dad, you have to trust because I'm sorry to say that after a weekend, they're not playing Wimbledon. Right. It's going to take some time. You have to be already committed mentally that you're going to dedicate yourself a couple of years to that system, to that program, to that mindset, because you cannot plant a seed and the next week it's blooming. You know, that's not, that's, we, we have to remember what the word development actually means, you know, and a good coach, a good program will give you some short-term objectives, will give you some midterm objectives, will give you some long-term objectives and define what long-term is, define what midterm is, define what short-term is, and then define what progress is. Winning a tournament isn't progress. That's not progress in development. We get too caught up on winning. You know, that's the problem. And look at my program. It's an ex- excellent program because we're winning. You know, okay, well, you're, te- you're 10 and 12 years old. We know statistically that a lot of successful 10 and 12 year olds don't make it by the time they're 17, 18. Okay. You know, so I've always had the, the mindset that you have to be honest, you have to communicate, you have to define certain things, and then you got to let the professional do their job. If you're not happy with it, you're able to voice your opinion, but stay committed. Stay committed. You know, you don't go see, I mean, you know, I think we laughed a little bit about this uh, in a separate conversation, I've said, but you don't go see an accountant and have the accountant and then tell the accountant what to do, right? You know, you go and you say, listen, I don't care how you do it, but obviously we, we want to maximize every opportunity out there and minimize this. And, and hopefully when I retire, have this amount, you know, 
it's a different conversation, but it's over time. It doesn't happen overnight. So I think you have to be very honest and sincere that it doesn't matter what the level of tennis that you want to play, whether it's recreational, whether it's uh, collegiate, you know, whether it's professional. At every stage, you have to be honest and sincere and give the coaches the opportunity to do their craft. You establish guidelines, you establish lanes of communication, and that, that, that shapes a healthy relationship. That doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect, and that doesn't mean that your kids are going to win. Heck, my kids were losing all the time. I mean, Bianca was winning, but Layla was losing all the time. You know, 0-0, oh and 1-1, oh, one and 2-2, one, two and two, you know, and when she'd win, I'd give her crap, you know, and when she'd lose, I'd high-five her. <laughs> like, you know, you, there's certain parameters that need to that need to exist, and and you know, you need to give yourself at least, you know, two years, 24 months to see some progress. As long as you define what progress is, I think I think you're on, you're on the right path. That that would be my advice to them. And on that note, when I've taken there was there was a period where you know they were all they had already told me that they wanted to really dedicate themselves to become tennis players. Okay. And I'm the one in our family that said, this is not going to happen. This is not going to happen. We're not doing it. We're not doing it, etc." So when that time came, you know, we had to decide on what program to bring the kids in. Okay. And I remember I sat down with, with the coach and, and, I, I said to the coach, you know, I said, look, my, my only objective is this, okay? I want the kids when they're 18 years old, I want to sit down and watch them play. And what I want to see is beautiful tennis, okay? I don't care that they win that day. I don't care that they lose that day. I just want them to master what it is that they're doing, which means all their strokes to mean the building of the game, their behavior on their court. I want to see what our values represent there, that moment. When they turn 18, Layla was 11. So you work backwards. You I never said, exactly. I never said, I want a national championship. I want a provincial championship. I never said, we have French Open on our list of things to do that we absolutely have to win, you know? So although I'm a pressure type of coach, it's never pressure to win. It's pressure to execute the best that you can that day, that moment, without any reasons or excuses. Because you're going to learn from that, which is different, you know. And I have heard my, many parents say, you know, I want my kids to get a great, you know, um, great education. You know, I want them to get a, a, a great scholarship. Yeah. Okay. But they still have to learn today what they have to do today. Right. So we put those lofty goals aside and let's get dedicated to the program. Let's give it a couple of years. Let's talk. Let's communicate. And your kids will learn. They will, you know, and winning and losing is just the end result of what you do in the moment. It is not part of what you're doing right now. And the sooner you can realize that, the more that your kids, your athletes are going to give more out of themselves all the time. That's my Absolutely. belief. No, no, that, that is very well said because, um, you know, the, the now I want it now is so big in, you know, like, you know, parents get impatient. I feel like a parents get impatient. Secondly, I'm not so sure a lot of parents have the stomach to uphold all the sufferings that the kids have to go through because there's no shortcut. I, I'm a true believer. You got to suffer. I call play dirty. You got to get your, you know, whatever you call it, suffering, dirty, whatever, right? Um, it's especially, I feel, for the um, privileged kids. Let's, let's be honest. When you go to a club, kids walk around with $1,000 equipment, rackets, bag, what, shoes, iPhone, whatever, right? So, uh, you know, it's, and then they go to tournaments. They start playing time. They go to tournaments. And the friend may be starting to do better. And the next thing you see is that, oh, the, the kid, I mean, kids are kids, 10, 11, 12, they're learning, they're going to mess up, they're going to make mistakes. And you see so many parents trying to micromanage 
micromanage, the next thing you know, they're looking for jumping from program to program and finding all sorts of uh, psychologists or whatever. I, you know, it doesn't make sense to me, right? So um, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Do you have to deal with that with your two girls? They're teenagers. What do you do with the phone? The, the pet peeve, the phone. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think you hit so many so many important things that you have to take care of right off the bat. You know, let's this is you know this is an elitist sport, okay? So it brings a certain type of community and certain type of behaviors that are completely in conflict with what you want your your athlete to do on the court. Nobody gives you anything on the court, so you have to go and earn it. Okay, you have to be hungry. It's hard to be hungry when you've never been hungry. You know. It's, right. it's conflicting feelings. You know, for me personally, you know, I completely disallowed my kids to having their phones even remotely close at practice. You know, the phone, the phone is not a toy. The phone, phone is a tool to communicate. So communicate, organize, be on top of what your homework, you know, if I see that you're spending too much time on, on social activities, you know, I take it away. And I usually, because I'm the coach, I usually have, a sort of, you know, quote unquote punishment while well, we're doing another half an hour fitness, you know, we're going to do extra, you know, that's when they're young, you know, um, when, you know, we came to a crossroad with Layla a couple of years ago when she did the junior U S open, um, you know, like some tournaments happen, all of a sudden her branch opened up and we go, wow, this is looking pretty good for you. You've gone through the hard, the hard test already. It opened up for you, you know, and, um, you know, she failed in the quarterfinals. And when I say fail, it's not that she didn't win. She didn't do what she's trained to do. You know, a lot of people see me upset when she wins and I'm upset because it's how she won. It's not, it's not by doing what we're training to do because sometimes you put winning there and you just want to win it. But I know that in a year, that's not going to work. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on s specific foundations that we need. So in two years, she's winning, not now. Right. So they see me upset. And then, like I said before, when they lose and she loses because she's doing difficult things, I give the high five. Well, in that particular moment, she didn't do anything right. So I wondered what was going on. And she had been traveling without me for, for quite a few months. And, then we discovered that, you know, her social online social life had begun, you know, and I said, okay, good. So when we got back to Florida, I, you know, we sat down and said, um, you know, because we analyzed what, ha what, ha what went wrong, you know, one of the greatest, you know, teachings that my dad gave me was, you know, say, listen, you know, there's only 24 hours a day and seven days a week. That's all you got. Okay. That's all you got. So figure it out. Okay, you can't do more and say, I'll add more hours to my day. So I explained to her, I said, you know, so now your social has increased. I understand it. I was your age once. I said, so it's suffering. Something else is suffering. And obviously the first thing that we notice is suffering is your tennis. So I gave her a choice. I said, look, I don't have a problem. You want to be a normal teenager. I'm all for it. You want to you know, go out to movies and you want to celebrate your birthday and you want to be online with your phone. I have no issues. You have the green light. But then there's no more international travel and I'm not your coach. If, if you get into the na national uh, um, training system and training, you know, the, with the Federation, and they want to take you on. Good, go. I said, but I'm not part of this. Now, if you're willing to sacrifice these personal things, then you got me. I'm never going to quit on you. That's your choice. You decide, you think about what you want, you know, because this is not my life. This is your life. She was older. So I think sometimes by putting them in that situation, you get to test a little bit their maturity. Now, mm -hmm. everybody says, you know, Layla's tennis is so mature, but she's had to make some tough decisions at that crucial moment. At that crucial moment, I didn't want to impose anything on her anymore. You know, she was 14, I believe, at the time. 
I didn't want to be the one, the military guy, you know, the iron fist as I'm known, you know. We already went through that in under 12. At 14, it had to be her choice because I have to put in more. They have to give in more. But if they're walking around with their phone and laughing and smiling, it's not going to work. On top of all of that, you have all kinds of studies that tell you how this is negating the number one ability that every high-level athlete requires. And every high level, it doesn't matter whether recreational, collegiate, or pro. Focus and concentration. That little thing takes that away. It gives you the, it gives you, um, it's an inability now to focus because every 30 seconds you're like, just, this is what you're doing. And you know, oh, uh, you know, you have to answer immediately. So it goes against you having the ability to concentrate. It goes against you having the ability of anal analyzing, problem solving, which we know that 90% of tennis is all mental. Right. So why am I going to go down a path when I see that, right? I'm not going to do it as a father and a hell of a lot less as a coach. There's no way that that's happening, you right. know, because I can't change the world. Can't do that. But I can make my own decisions, you know? Yeah. So she came back the next day and she says, you know what? I want to, I want to keep doing this. You know, this is what I want. Okay. And she had lost in the semifinals against Coco Goff at the French. She had lost in the quarterfinals against Camila. And uh, she came back renewed, right? But it was a piece that she has to give up. So the message is, you know, parents, you, 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 kind, you have to lay down the law. You know, you can't go into a meeting with a client and be looking at your phone all the time. Mm -hmm. You know? You can't, you can't be a doctor and be in the middle of something and then look at the phone and say, oh, can you hold on a second? You know? So if in our lives that doesn't exist, what makes it acceptable for our kids who have less experience that we do and need more focus and concentration, more dedication, it's acceptable for them to do it. Set some parameters and you have to be stern and, and make sure that they respect the program, they respect the coach, they respect the time that they're there, and they give 100% due in that moment, you know, and, yeah. and that's the best thing that we can do, I think. Yeah. So I have a question for you uh, from Shelly. Uh, tennis is such a long and costly journey. Have you ever doubted your decision on raising Layla as a professional player? How did you train her to have the good qualities required, such as perseverance, positive attitude? That's a, that's a great question, Shelley, and thank you for that. Um, yeah, I doubt it every day. <laughs> okay. Every day I doubt it. You know, oh, do share. <laughs> you know, I mean, look, um, we fail more daily than what we succeed, you know? Mm -hmm. That's the reality. Mm -hmm. The reality is that statistically you look at who makes it, it's not a very big percentage, you know? And one of the things that you hear me yell all the time on the court when I get upset, you know, I say, you know, to be a top 10 player, there's only 10 people in the whole world that are gonna make it. In the whole tennis world that we know, only 10 are gonna make it. So because I have that mindset and I expect you to give me a hundred percent every day, a hundred percent. I don't take 80. I don't take 98. I don't take 99. As a matter of fact, I don't want 105 to give me 105. You have to give me a hundred percent for many years. And only then we'll know that it's a hundred percent. How do I know it's a hundred percent? You know, I'm the type of uh, person that doesn't believe in limits. So because of that, every day is a test on perseverance, is a test on endurance. Every day is a test on your character and your mindset. And if you do that every day, you're building a person that is not only going to be ready to compete on court, but also off court. You know, my, my, my training programs, you know, my tennis practices, and, you know, if it's two hours, there is no two minute break 
you know, with the water. No, no, because in tennis, you get 20 seconds, 30 seconds, you know, it's always constantly like that. So I'm constantly pushing, 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 mimicking what is happening on in an actual match. And then there's a lot of tears. There's a lot of sweat, right? There's a lot of um, discussion. And afterwards, when we're off the court, we have that conversation about how it's going to be difficult. You know, um, Layla has improved her serve, for example, dramatically, you know. But for many years, for the last four years, I have been told by every single expert that she will never have a serve. Everything is completely incorrect. But I never looked at it as a short-term thing. I always looked at it as a long-term thing. Yes, I agree with everybody that, that, that they're telling me that. But first, we have to lay down some foundations of perseverance, of, of suffering, of hard work, in order for her to get strong, very strong. And when we get to that part, we don't have to worry about this. So when we finally started working on her serve, she was already minded to see the importance of working on the serve. So even then I would yell out, that's not good enough. And it was a beautiful serve. <laughs> you know, it's not good enough. I would say it's not good enough. You know, mm. the percentages aren't making sense. So you have to commit yourself to every day of whatever values you want to instill. And as more as difficult as it is to do it, if you break, they break. If you quit, they'll quit. You know, that's the way it works. So you have to set the example that you are not movable in whatever demand you decide you're going to have, you know, and I'm not movable. So somewhere along the line, she, I think she realized both Leila and Bianca realized that they have to now keep up and show me that they're not going to break easily when my objective every day is to make sure that we train without any limits and discomfort, you know, and that's why when she gets to a match, she seems so serene, you know, this has nothing to do with the fact that I'm abusing them on the court. That has nothing to do with it. That's completely different, you know, but there are consequences that they have to go through as athletes. I've had to do push-ups in the mud, you know, hold my face in the mud, you know, and I wasn't alone. The whole team had to do it. And why was there mud? Because it was raining and, you know, the dirt turns to mud, you know. Then you lift up and you do your push-up again. You lift up and, you know, for the person outside, it seems like, oh, my God, this is really harsh. But it wasn't intended to be harsh. It was intended for you to become stronger, you know. And if once you understand that as an athlete, you're able to give more of those values that you want your kids to have and do that without any intentions of them winning or losing when she won the french open the junior french open i had to pinch myself because i never thought of it i never thought of it never did i think of it in a million years that's not why we do things you know and i think we all educate our kids to make sure that they become you know great people great citizens you know and that's what I was trying to do for her to become that, to be humble, you know, to understand how we can really change the world if we dedicate ourselves to what we're doing. And I think that was the mindset and everything else just kind of happened because she just happened to do them good. You know, that's, that's all it was. So that's the, 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 the journey. And because of that, the more that she gave, the more I was willing to give, you know, that's it. The more money I put into it. But, you know, um, it's just really what you've just shared of your teachings resonates with my theory all along. My theory is every parent has their own set of values. Like you said earlier, every you know, profession, right? To be a doctor, you have, they have to grind with the intern, you know, hours and hours of that. In order to grind those hours, you have to persevere. So that doctor has that core values of, and what it doesn't matter what you do, you're going to need that core value with you. And this part is something that I believe that parents can do better off, of tennis parents can do better off, 
instead of if, if I well I'm I'm well, I know tennis so I'm not, I'm a bad example to use. Let's say if I I'm a doctor or or I'm an accountant, right? To be an accountant, you have to study tremendously. I just did my taxes the other day. I get a headache from that, right? But you know, so you got to persevere in that profession to be able to be certified. Why not? transfer your core values of who that person is into your child instead of the accountant trying to teach the kid tennis, you know, because I'm a believer inside out. So once you're able to in, you know, install that those beliefs and values into your kids beliefs into their heads, they can, it doesn't matter where you put them and they can go pretty far, whatever they do. So I, you know, my hope with you in, in this session is that they, that's a takeaway is look at their own values, look, look at their own core. That's what you want to transfer over to your kid. Um, I got a question from Kevin, uh, Kevin from Switzerland. How often do you intervene and correct mistakes while practice? Should you give the player some time or say something almost after every mistake? How do you keep it positive? That, those are three questions. <laughs> well, okay, that's great, Kevin. Hi, how are you? Um, I think I know who you are. Um, <laughs> so first of all, you know, there's different phases, right? For, in the way that I look at things. So the first, the first phase is um, what is it that you want to do? So you have to explain, depending on the age of who, you know, you're teaching, you have to explain that critique is not positive. Okay. And, you know, you know, I hear a lot of, you know, we have to have constructive criticism and all of that stuff, but criticism stays criticism. You know, whoever's getting constructive criticism usually doesn't feel good about it. So it doesn't matter if you put constructive in front of it or not. Okay. They understand that what they did is incorrect and now they have to change it. So the term positivity, I throw out the window, you know, with, in my particular way of, of teaching is that if, you have, I have the patience for the same. If you do the mistake one time, no problem. Two times, three times, forget it. Four times, that's it. Five times, it's over, you know? And the reason for that is because in specific high-level sports and tennis, you can't allow yourself to do five mistakes in a row. That's the problem. I didn't create this rule, you know? So how do you, how do you, um, convince your athlete to start looking at the, at the mistake that they did, forget about it and get back to it. So I put a little bit more pressure on it uh, by saying, Oh, you know, for example, I'll be extremely negative and I'll say, you know, this really sucks. This is horrible. Right. You know, right now you're down love 40 and you've hit the ball three times. Congratulations. Way to go. And then in between, I say, now you do the mental process that I have taught you. So get focused, understand the mental process. This is the time that you do it. So that's the little help that you give. Your job as a coach is to get them into trouble in training. How else are they going to learn to get out of trouble? You know, I've seen so many coaches look, look at Leila and say, that's a, a wonderful, great, fantastic. And I said, fantastic what? You know, it's like looking at a boxer hitting a heavy bag and you tell him he's a great boxer. Uh uh, the heavy bag doesn't punch back, <laughs> you know? So, you know, positivity is, is obviously a definable thing depending on the athlete that you have. I like to call my coaching or what I'm doing is elite level. So we're gonna take and, and beat you down psychologically and give you the tools for you to get out of your mess, psychologically speaking, okay? I'm not here to teach you how to hit a forehand. You should know already. And I'm not here to how to correct you. And if we find that we need to correct your forehand, we will go get the specialist that is incredibly, incredibly good at doing this part. You know, that's, you know, parents out there, surround yourself with people that you trust and give them the opportunity to correct things technically and tactically. You know, you can help them by giving them the values that it takes to realize that we need these, these types of help. So, you know, again, um, positivity is not exactly my, uh, my strength. I try to make it very difficult for them so they can learn how to get out of that difficulty in training. And then all they have to do in a match 
is duplicate, replicate what they have been doing in training all that time. Okay. I think, does that answer the question, at least the last part? I didn't, I don't remember the first part. Yeah, you know, that that is very interesting because I really believe, um, you know, when I was coaching, with, when I was still on court coaching, I guess I don't do that anymore. I, I'm not coaching parents and, and you know, uh, consulting. But when I was coaching in the program with all these players from national players, whatever, I always thought they got it wrong. You know, I could see they get their bag and they come to the courts and thinking, I'm going to have a great day of training. For me, that's completely the opposite. You ha I, it's not being negative because I would go like, okay, I arm myself mentally. This is going to be tough as heck. So I'm ready. You know, but then I see them walking, you know, from school with their bag and they're giggling. It's like, this is like they're going to a party. And I'm like, oh my God, it doesn't take very much. You just take a drop of imperfection and then they go, they go absolutely ballistic and they can't function anymore on the court, you know, and this is the part that you were talking about. You got to be able, in order to be able to handle pressure, you got to be mentally ready. And that starts from preparation because by the time you get to when it needs it, it's there. So absolutely. And I think, and I think, you know, people that have seen my training or have witnessed some other things and, you know, they say, you know, some kindly adjectives of, the way that I behave. And then they look at Layla afterwards and, you know, advancing and progressing and you hear the comments saying she's so serene and she's so, you know, her mindset is so strong. She wasn't born like that. You know, let's be honest, you know, and we do this in everything. My oldest daughter is a dentist and then she went through the same thing because I told her that her professors were not going to be nice to her. Okay, And they're not going to be nice to her, not because they don't like her, but because they want to give society the best possible dentist. So instead of being hurt by what they're saying, listen to what they're saying and change adequately, you know, and that's why, you know, I always get the comment from different coaches that my kids are extremely coachable, you know, because they go in already with an open mindset that they want to hear what you have to say and, and then do what you're telling them to do. And they're not afraid of hard work and they can take honesty. That is the biggest thing. They won't take it personally. They, they know the difference. Yeah. And if they do take it personally, they have to refocus because we do mental preparation. We do it. What you see on court, you know, everybody, you don't see what we do in the background. So they know how to handle it. Absolutely. I, that's why I love that behind the scenes more than anything. Be, you know, it, that's where it's happening, right? So we have time for our last question. Um, it's from, oops, where did it go here? It's from Alex. Uh, we're playing in North America, most on hard courts. Professionals recommend to play more on clay to develop a full court game with a lot of variety. What is your opinion? That's a, that's a great question. Um, my personal opinion is that you can't be great at everything. Okay. One of the mistakes that I, that I, my personal opinion, please do not take it out of context. Okay. You know, I, I think that we spend um, as North Americans way too much time putting spin on the ball, like the Spaniards and the Italians and the French do. We are hardcore players. It is in our blood, okay? <laughs> so let's work at being hardcore players first. You know, let's be great at one thing and not good at everything, okay? So where does it say that the rule, you know, specifies that you can only have an all-court player if you train in clay? No. You can teach it on hardcore because that's what I've done. The difference is, is that obviously it goes faster on hard court than on clay. So on clay, it goes so slow. So you have to build your point and you have an opportunity to build your point better. But let me, let me put it to you in my way. We build points on hard court. So when we get to clay, it's slower. And now we have fun, right? So we specialize on hardcore, and that's why she had success in Acapulco, 
that's why she had success in in Switzerland um, against um, Belinda. You know the the conditions were perfect for how she grew up. Okay, but the reality is is that I didn't never wanted her to be an expert in clay because that's not part of her her upbringing. You know, Nadal won on clay first. And once he won on clay, he tried to figure out how to win on grass and how to win on hardcore. This is not something that comes in the inverses with Federer, with he had a hard time on clay. You know, I think we try, we get desperate and we want our kids to be great on clay, on grass, on hard. You know, I say, listen, you don't have enough time to do all of them. Pick one that is culturally from your country, get great at it. And once you get great at it, understand that you're gonna fail in, on grass, understand that you're going to fail on, on clay. But when, when they've mastered the one, it's easier to start teaching the subtleties and the subtle differences of the other. Then, you know, it takes time. And you're talking 18, 19, 20, you know, but not now. You know, I mean, I got criticized for pulling Layla out of Wimbledon. So mm -hmm. it was a very you know, easy decision for me. He said, look, we don't practice on grass. So if we don't practice on grass, basically we're going in blindly, you know, throwing the quarter up in the sense and hopefully she'll do well, right? Mm -hmm. I don't enter a tournament to hopefully do well. We're either ready or we're not ready. We're not ready. Let's go and do and keep training. So I said, no, we, we know that we're not ready for this tournament. Let's pull out. We're going to rest mentally, emotionally, psychologically, and we're gonna get back to training. And I know that in the future, we're gonna train on grass and we'll put you in Wimbledon. And guess what? You're gonna be great at it when it happens because it suits your style a lot better, you know? So those are hard decisions from, from a coaching perspective. Like South Americans, I have a lot of South American friends and they wanna play hardcore. Their kids have been playing on clay their whole life. You know how difficult it is for them to get the speed of the ball coming back on hard court. So if you want to get points out there, do clay tournaments if you come from clay countries. Okay. Go get points on hard court tournaments if you come from hard court countries. It'll it'll fix already 50%, 60-70% of your problems. <laughs> well said, uh, George. Well, there are so many questions still waiting to be answered, but unfortunately we're out of time. Time, that 24 hour seven only. So thank you so much, George, for giving us your time and sharing your tennis journey with Leila and Bianca. Best of luck to the family, to the program, stay safe. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you for having me. I hope it helped a little bit. And you know, I'm always here for you, Patricia. You guys thank are you. unbelievable. Say hi to everybody for me. I will. Have a great time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. So that concludes our session today. I hope you got a lot out of it. Well, I did. Um, so looking forward to next Saturday at 11 o'clock right here. I have our guest who is a common name in the household to Canadians. He is responsible for Canadians, um, for tennis in Canada, juniors, female, male, you name it, he was in it. And I'm happy to be having a chat with Sylvain Bruneau next Saturday at 11 o'clock. I'll see you here. And meanwhile, have a great week and stay safe.